Coming to you direct from his custom-built deluxe solar power studio deep within the bowels of Empire State Suburbia, it's time for Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Yeah, thank you very much, John Carroll, both writing the music and doing the intro. So many different ways you can contribute to Stand Up with Pete Dominic daily, and thank you very much. If you already have, welcome new subscribers and welcome to your week. It's Monday, May 17th as I post this. Remember as you kick off the beginning of the week to recognize the thoughts that you're thinking. Try to be mindful in the moment. Train yourself to do that by meditating, by journaling, by talking to other people about the thoughts that you're thinking. Remember that. I always like to remind myself a few times a day, as a matter of fact, catch myself going, what the hell? I just spent 15 minutes worried about getting an infection after I cut my finger. Come on now, that's ridiculous. Now go clean your finger. I couldn't think of anything. I didn't actually cut my finger, but I'm sure that my mind went down the wrong road more than a few times over the weekend where I had a chainsaw out and a... A cultivator, a tiller, trying to replace or move my garden from one side of my house to another has been an even bigger undertaking than I thought it would be. But enjoyable all the way. I rented a, a couple of these machines that I just mentioned from Home Depot, and I got after it. Not very good. It really wasn't worth it. Neither of them worked the way I needed them to. But I did get these limbs cut down, and I didn't cut off any of my own. <laughs> I've got two great guests joining me on today's program. Congresswoman from the state of Washington named Tara Simmons, who has a fascinating story. She had a child when she was a teenager. She became a nurse and then became a lawyer and then now a congresswoman, a state rep in Washington. She also, I didn't even mention it, went to prison. She was sent to prison. It's quite a story that she has to tell, and we're so lucky that she told us here on stand up all about it that's coming up also india walton who is another amazing woman with some sad similarities there in terms of the maladies that she's had to experience in her life but has learned and grown from them all both these women so inspiring i learned so much from talking to them but india joined me last week and then i said hey you should join our live hangout the happy hour hangout that we do thursday night so india it took me up on that invitation, and we continued our conversation about police accountability and several other issues with a live group of over 45 stand-up subscribers who also ask questions, great questions, and that was a lot of fun. So those both coming up, India Walton and Rep. Tara Simmons both joining me. Hope you guys are doing okay. Hope you and your kids have gotten vaccinated and you're getting out there in the world safely and securely. I did that on Saturday night. I did my first stand-up comedy set in New York City since the pandemic began. Went over to my friend Christian Finnegan's wife's venue in Queens, Astoria, Queens. Great place. If you're ever in and around New York, Queens, definitely check it out. QED. And I had a pretty good set. It was all right. It was a good little group and we had a lot of fun. It was great to see Christian in person. He's having open heart surgery this week, so thinking a lot about him. But I hope that you're doing good. And before we get to the guest interviews, let's, of course, recap the news over the weekend. Do my best to stay away from the screens, especially the news on the weekends. But it was uh, hard to avoid the horrible violence in Gaza and Israel between Palestinians and the Israeli Defense Forces. And you know what? I don't have anything for you on that issue during today's news segment, I've got politics, I got COVID, maybe a couple of other things, but I'm not I'm not covering it today because there's so much out there. I just decided I could spend an hour playing clips and talking around it. But I am talking to Aaron David Miller and other experts this week about what's happening, how this may be different than times horrible, violent clashes in the Middle East in times past. So that's coming up. But right now, let's get to it right now. That news segment I like to call the last 24. Okay, here we go with the COVID headlines. A lot of confusion over the masks. Ricky Schroeder is pissed off. Apparently, Scott Baio is jealous that Ricky Schroeder is pissed off about Costco requiring masks. But here are some just some headlines on COVID-related stories. A wave of pandemic refugees 
at the U.S.-Mexico border has caught the Biden administration by surprise. In Brazil, babies and small children are dying of the virus in disturbingly high numbers. The assault on Gaza halts COVID shots and could spread the virus, according to U.N. officials. A major nurses union is condemning the CDC's new mask advice for vaccinated people. And reports of new cases, however, are at their lowest level since September. Deaths are at their lowest level since July. Some of the states with the worst early spring outbreaks have seen the most significant progress. Cases are down about 70 percent in the last two weeks in New Jersey and down about 40 percent in Michigan and New York. And the pace of vaccination, while it slowed considerably over the last month, but the authorization of Pfizer vaccine for the use of 12 to 15 year olds means millions more Americans are now eligible. And now let me check in with some of the Sunday shows in terms of the Fauci's and the CDC, Russell Walensky's, Dr. Walensky's. But before that, you got to hear Ricky Schroeder at Costco. Ricky Schroeder, of course, of Silver Spoons. This guy, not a good guy. His uh, resume is rap sheet. I interviewed him at Sirius. He was weird and I didn't much. Uh, he was he was nice to me. But of course, he was on my show trying to get promotion for whatever. He was doing some kind of um, supporting uh, veterans organization, which is why I had him on. But anyway, he is a, a, a right wing absolute lunatic with a history of a lot of anger, even domestic abuse. Apparently, uh, we all loved him growing up watching Silver Spoons. Love that show. But uh, you wouldn't hear Alfonso Ribeiro or Jason Baton and doing something like this. What's your name? My name is Jason. And who do you, what do you do here? I'm a supervisor, front end supervisor. And why aren't you letting me in? Because in the state of California, in the county of Los Angeles, there has been no... And Costco, there has been no change to our mask policy. Not in the state of California or in the county of Didn't you see the news? You didn't see the news. Nationwide nationwide Costco that said you don't need to wear a mask. Actually, that's not accurate. What what is accurate? So what is accurate is that Costco always, always goes above and beyond when following the law. And the mandate in California has not changed. There does seem to be the possibility that in June, by mid-June, that's a date that California... I know oh, if they allow at. us, if they, if they grant us that, our kings, the people in power, you're going to listen to these people? Well, I know they destroyed our economy. Well, they're sir, destroying they're our culture. They're destroying our state. I see. And you're just going to listen to their rules. Well, what we are going to do is simply follow the guidelines. Okay. I'm getting my refund. I'm getting my refund from Costco. I suggest everybody in California get their refund from Costco. Give up your membership to Costco until they remove this. Okay, well, this hasn't changed in any building uh, in California, in any company that I'm aware of. The places I shop still require okay. masks. But that's not the point. The point is Costco is simply abiding by the law, and that's the law. Here's my refund. You're the manager? I'm the manager. Okay, I'm suggesting everybody in California get a refund from Costco until this rule is lifted. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. All right, well, that was nice. The truth is a lot of people are, really are confused. And it's how you handle those situations, I think, that determines what, what kind of person, what kind of character you have. Everybody does get frustrated and patient. Certainly I do and have. But I'm still going by whatever makes people feel comfortable. I'm just going to do whatever makes people feel comfortable. I think we still have a lot of free will in all of these situations with whether or not we want to go into a store or an office or visit a friend with a mask on. And I think we can I think we can ride this confusion out for a couple of weeks. We don't have to take sides and get angry about this, whether you wear a mask or whether you don't wear a mask or whether you're asked to wear a mask. Let's just try to make each other feel comfortable. Does not seem like a noble pursuit that one needs high moral character to understand and i think a lot of times media social media drives us apart but we can we can absolutely be reasonable even though i think it's stupid to have to wear a mask outside at my daughter's track meet if my if the coaches if the school wants me to do it for a couple more weeks fine i want to see my daughter i, I want to watch my daughter if they want me to wear a mask i'll wear a mask i i do not think anybody's treading on me at least not for a while as absurd as some of these regulations still seem so Calm down. I can't even believe, by the way, Ricky Schroeder uh, can afford a Costco membership. When was when was his last? When did he work last? Uh, anyway, uh, there you go. There's that asshole. And of course, I think the uh, the Costco supervisor is probably going to get some good attention. He's he's being 
seen as uh, the the mature hero, and I'm sure the Costco corporate office didn't miss that. All right, now let's go to the experts. I'll stop making you dumber with the gossip, but that was really went viral <laughs> yesterday, of course, because of Ricky Schroeder being who he is. He's also wearing one of the uh, the the blue uh, police line American flag hats on. I mean, just a lot of anger out there. I I get it. I have a lot of anger myself, burbling and bubbling, but. We can all be better in those situations. And let's try to, I mean, there, there's blame to go around in terms of the guidance that has come from the government. I think they have a tough position and we can rightly criticize them. But let's try to clear it up for you right now by hearing from Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky. Here is uh, John Dickerson, who I love, over on CBS Face the Nation with Dr. Fauci yesterday. With you, the new guidance on masks is confusing people a little because two weeks ago, the CDC said that people who had been vaccinated were safer while wearing masks. Now there's new guidance. What changed in that period? Well, what's happened, there's been an accumulation of data, John, uh, showing in the real world effectiveness of the vaccines. It is even better than in the clinical trials, well over 90 percent protecting you against disease, number one. Number two, a number of papers have come out in the past couple of weeks showing that the vaccine protects even against the variants that are circulating. And thirdly, we're seeing that it is very unlikely that a vaccinated person, even if there's a breakthrough infection, would transmit it to someone else. So the accumulation of all of those scientific facts, information and evidence brought the CDC to make that decision to say now when you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask, not only outdoors, but you don't need to wear it indoors. Yeah, I highly recommend getting vaccinated so you don't have to worry about that. Of course, the question is, what are people just going to be on the honor system? Generally, the answer has been, well, who cares? As long as you're vaccinated, you don't have to be as concerned. But there's a lot of gray area there, of course. Let's go back to Dickerson Fauci on CBS's Face the Nation. If I have no symptoms and I have been vaccinated, but I, I but I am infected, what's the difference between that and if I have no symptoms and am infected but have not been vaccinated? Good question, John. And what the what the issue is is that the level of virus in your nasal pharynx, which is correlated with whether or not you were going to transmit it to someone else is considerably lower. So even though there are breakthrough infections with vaccinated people, almost always the people are asymptomatic and the level of virus is so low, it makes it extremely unlikely, not impossible, but very, very low likelihood that they're going to transmit it. Whereas when people who are getting infected, who are without symptoms, who are not vaccinated, generally the titer or the level of virus, relatively speaking, is higher than in the vaccinated individual. All right. Did you get all that nasal pharynx? I wonder if Ricky Schroeder knows what the nasal pharynx is. To be fair, I didn't and still don't. But I bet you I have a really hot one. All right, one final clip from CBS Face the Nation. Chad Dickerson, Fauci, trying to clear up the confusion. On the public health messaging of this, one of the this kind of caught some people by surprise. And uh, because people have been so confused over the course of the last 14 months, would it have been better to prepare the way a little bit more for this? Good news, of course, for everyone. But but because there has been so much confusion over time, would it have been better to kind of walk people up to this very uh, kind of head snapping new news? Well, you know, John, people will say that there may be some merit to that. But as a matter of fact, the CDC did did this and took this action based on the data. What they'll do now, and I know we've discussed that with the CDC director, what they'll be doing now is coming out very quickly with individual types of guidances. So people will say, well, what about the workplace? What about this? What about that? And I think that's going to be clarified, John, pretty quickly. I would imagine within a period of just a couple of weeks, you're going to start to see significant clarification of some of the actually understandable and reasonable questions that people are asking. Sounds like Dr. Fauci has talked to Dr. Walensky at the CDC. So you're going to have to clear it up. I think I think you've been inconsistent or unclear. And a lot of people are, of course, upset about that. Well, let's check in with her. She was on NBC yesterday on Meet the Press with man with a middle school 
boy face and unlikable personality anchor Chuck Todd. If you live in a mixed vaccinated household and you're fully vaccinated, do you go out? What do you do? You know, I think that that's going to be family by family. People are going to have to decide whether um, their children will understand that if they're younger than the age of 12, that they're going to have to wear a mask if the rest of the family is not. We have this for many other policies uh, that, that influence families at different age ranges. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think that that's going to have to be a family by family decision. I also want to convey that because our guidance changed on Thursday, there's no need for everybody to start ripping off their masks. We have been told for 16 months to keep ourselves and our families safe Mm -hmm. by putting a mask on, those behaviors are going to be really hard to change. And there is no mandate to take it off. What we're saying is now this is safe. Work at your own speed. Work with your own family and your own businesses to remove them when necessary. And then Chuck Todd went on to ask, well, what if you get Ricky Schroeder and you're just you're you're trying to do your job working at the Costco or wherever? What is a business supposed to do when somebody walks in without a mask? Assume that they're abiding by the rules. You know, we are asking people to be honest with themselves. If they are vaccinated and they are not wearing a mask, they are safe. If they are not vaccinated and they are not wearing a mask, they are not safe. And what we're asking businesses to do, probably the most important thing that businesses could do right now is is to work to ensure that it's easy for their own employees to get vaccinated and to give them the time that they need so that they can make those appointments and get themselves vaccinated so those bi- people in those businesses are safe. So you're counting on businesses to do vaccine mandates? We're not counting on vaccine mandates at all. It may very well be that local local businesses, local jurisdictions will work towards vaccine mandates. That is going to be locally driven and not federally driven. Well, that clears it up. I'm sure it's going to be rolled out really smoothly and uh, not confusing at all. Let's be patient with each other, folks. So Dr. Walensky turned around. There was another camera. And guess who it was? Martha Raddatz at ABC. You said on Friday that the CDC is empowering the American people to make their own decisions about their own health. But this is all on the honor system. And there are people who refuse to get vaccinated, about a quarter of the country, and who oppose mask wearing, who could see this as a green light to go wear they want, putting others at risk, especially in those indoor settings, including children and the immunocompromised. So um, this is a really important point, and that is the guidance that we released on Thursday is about individuals and what individuals are at risk of doing if they are not vaccinated. If they're vaccinated, they are safe. If they are not vaccinated, they are not safe. They should still be wearing a mask or, better yet, get vaccinated. We also need to say that this is not permission for widespread removal of masks for those who are vaccinated. It may take some time for them to feel comfortable removing their masks, but also that these decisions have to be made at the jurisdictional level, at the community level. Some community have been hit harder than others, have lower vaccination rates than others. We wanted to deliver the science at the individual level, but we also understand that these decisions have to be made at the community level. All right, saying kind of the same thing over again, that they don't want this to come from the big federal government from the top. We want people to make up their own minds on whether or not they're going to continue to require masks or ask people to wear masks or wear masks. All right, now let me shift gears to politics, the Republican Party, the future of the Republican Party, what they believe. I I talked about this in my stand-up act over the weekend where I basically said, I have a threat. There's no liberal or conservative anymore. There's no Democrats or Republicans. There's just people that live in reality and people that don't. And many of them identify as Trump supporters and Republicans. But I have a threshold now test, a a litmus test, if you will, where I ask a few questions, starting with something easy like, how many moons does Earth have? Well, John Dickerson had a smarter way of uh, looking at it in terms of the data surrounding it. Here he is setting us up for the next segment here to talk about the politics of it all. John Dickerson back on Face the Nation. Last week, House Republicans voted to oust Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming as a member of their leadership and replace her with Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York. Cheney has maintained that the Republican Party must confront Donald Trump's lie that the 2020 election was fraudulent and face up to his role in promoting the insurrection on January 6th. Cheney's ouster was not simply an internal squabble within the GOP, but a signal about how unified the party is around Donald Trump. 
A CBS News poll taken after Cheney's removal shows that 80 percent of Republicans believe her ouster was a good move. The 20 percent who did not think so demonstrates how little appetite there is for a Trump-free Republican Party. Our elections and surveys director, Anthony Salvanto, notes that the small percentage supporting Cheney are less likely to report voting in Republican primaries, making them even less powerful in shaping the Republican future. Who is important in that future? The former president. 66% of respondents said being loyal to Donald Trump was important, compared to the 33% who said it was not. I don't know how you can disagree with the idea that the concept, the premise that the Republican Party that we grew up knowing and following and seeing and some of us supporting at times on different issues of the Bush family, the Reagans, the 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 McCain's, the Romney's, it's gone. It's over. It's now the Palin's and the Newt Gingrich's and the Sean Hannity's and the Alex Jones, the Ted Cruz's. And of course, the Donald Trump's white supremacists, conspiracy theorists, authoritarians, fascists, grifters. That's all that's left for the modern day Republican Party. Does anybody disagree? If you disagree, send me an email right now. I'd love to know your analysis. And I would love to be wrong about that, by the way. Stand up with Pete at Gmail dot com. Here is Liz Cheney. She was on ABC's this week. John Carl sat down with her and I thought these were uh, some great clips right here. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with a woman who supported Donald Trump over 90 percent of the time and is part of the reason why he was there. So let's not forget that. What, what was your experience on that day during the riot? Did you feel like you were in danger? One thing I will never forget, I was on the aisle and I looked across the aisle. Uh, Jamie Raskin was sitting on the other side of the aisle and uh, you could hear the mob coming and and he looked at me and he and he showed me his phone and he he said Liz there's a confederate flag flying in the rotunda and and that moment of you know uh this cannot be happening in the United States of America this shit has been happening in the United States of America forever including in your state stop it just because one got into the capitol rotunda don't be shocked I am happy that that's where you draw the line at the Confederate flag. But had you spoken out against it before? Well, in fact, what we heard this week is we saw members of the Republican Party in the House basically deny it happened. We saw one Republican congressman say that the that the protesters were orderly. Another one said they saw no evidence that Trump supporters were actually among the rioters. I mean, what does it say that some are able to erase the memory of what happened on January 6th. It's indefensible. I will never forget seeing the law enforcement officers, the members of the SWAT team, the rapid response forces, seeing them in their exhaustion. And they'd been through hand-to-hand combat and, and you know, people died. And the notion that this, it just, it, you know, the notion that this was somehow a tourist event um, is disgraceful and despicable. And, uh, you know, I won't be part of of whitewashing what happened on January 6th. Nobody should be part of it, and people ought to be held accountable. Yes, yes, don't whitewash white supremacy, and let's hold some people accountable. I think a good question John Carl should have asked is, how many of her colleagues in the Republican Party actually believe this stuff? How many of your colleagues actually believe that stuff, (laughs) actually believe the election was stolen? I think it's a relatively small number. Adam Kinzinger says it's a handful. Is that? Do you think I that's think right? that's probably right. So they're just saying it to placate Donald Trump. You know, I think that we as a party uh, are in a situation with respect to the former president that is really dangerous. Well, I think the really big and important news uh, at the end of last week is that House members announced a bipartisan deal for a January six commission. Washington Post reporting a group of House Democrats and Republicans announced Friday that they had struck a deal to establish an independent commission to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, a significant breakthrough after months of partisan standoff over the mandate for such a panel and whether it should exist at all. Let's wait and see what this panel looks like. Is it actually nonpartisan? There were a lot of uh, questions about the 9-11 commission, which gets so much credit. And, uh, of course, the Warren Commission, the Tower Commission. What do these commissions really look like? We'll wait and see. 
But here is uh, Congressman Fred Upton of, I think, Michigan. He was on CNN State of the Union with Dana Bash talking about it. So Leader McCarthy spoke to then President Trump at, on January 6th as the rioters were inside the Capitol. Liz Cheney said he should testify before the commission. Do you agree? Yeah, well, my sense is that that body, the, the 10 people that are there, are going to subpoena a number of folks. Uh, I would suspect, and I'm not a lawyer, I would suspect that uh, Kevin will be uh, subpoenaed. He'll be asked to give his uh, rendition of what happened, as will a number of members of Congress that were there, whether they were barricading the doors inside the chamber. I wasn't actually in the chamber when it happened, but I was obviously on Capitol Hill. I have some broken glass, in fact, that I picked up when we returned from votes that night. Uh, for, for votes th that night. But yeah, they're going to subpoena a number of people. It's it's important to get to the truth and find out just how widespread this thing was and what can we do to make sure that it never can happen again. All right. That's Fred Upton on State of the Union with Dana Bash. And we'll see what happens with this commission, which will have the power to subpoena witnesses, but not without an agreement between the appointed uh, chairs of, of both parties. I'm going to read more into this, learn more about it, and have somebody on to talk about it so we can understand its significance, the timeline of it, and what, if anything, its conclusions will determine. Because Republicans are probably just going to, at the end, be like, you know what? It uh, it didn't, uh, didn't investigate the left-wing radical Antifa organizations and the, the BLMs and all of them. That's, of course, what they wanted. But... Those organizations aren't really organizations. Certainly Antifa is, and there's a lot of uh, uh, Bla Black Lives Matter organizations, of course, but they're not terrorists. They're, they're community organizers. They're activists. They're amazing, brilliant, inspired, strong, hardworking folks trying to create change in their communities, certainly with BLM, and Antifa isn't a thing, and neither of them attacked any state capital like all of these ones on the right have in Michigan and other places, and certainly didn't attack the capital of the United States of America and kill people. All right, let's go back to CNN. Dana Bash, State of the Union. She had the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, on, who is also a Republican. At a House hearing this week, Republican after Republican distorted the facts about the Capitol insurrection. Uh, uh, Georgia Congressman Andrew Clyde, who you can see he is here at the center of this photo, barricading the House chamber doors on January 6th, compared what you're looking at right now, what our viewers are, Governor, to a normal tourist visit. You, Governor, since you're uh, local in D.C., you spent January 6th fielding de desperate calls from lawmakers asking for help. So why are so many of these elected Republicans lying about what happened that day? Well, it's definitely revisionist history, and it's 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 crazy, in my opinion. I mean, everybody saw exactly what happened, and I was in the middle of that, as you say. We were mm -hmm. getting desperate calls from the leaders of Congress who were under attack, and, you know, the the Capitol Police were overwhelmed. We sent in the, the Maryland State Police and the, and the Maryland National Guard to try to put down the insurrection. And people to say that that didn't happen, uh, you know, it, it's, just, uh, it's just nuts. By the way, that asshole congressman last week who compared the insurrectionists to tourists and said if you'd seen the videos and didn't know about it, you, you wouldn't know the difference. There's now photographs of that guy barricading the door with furniture. So he is just making it all up. Here's Congressman Jason Crow. Now, he's a Democrat, and he was a hero on that day. He's also a veteran, and so he uh, had his head on and his training kicked in. He was on MSNBC with Ali Velshi. Here's what he had to say about the commission and other things. Yeah, I mean, the challenges between this one and the 9-11 are clear and that you have it, you know, in the House GOP right now and Kevin McCarthy, people that don't want to talk about this event because uh, it was incited by Donald Trump, uh, the leader of their party, who continues to have a, a stranglehold on their party. And you just, you know, there's no further evidence of that than what happened to Liz Cheney this past week, who stood up and, and, and spoke out against him. Uh, and was removed from her leadership position at the same time as you have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and others who continue to do abhorrent things, and yet nobody says anything about them. So uh, it's very clear what direction that caucus continues to go in. Uh, he just doesn't want to talk about it, uh, he being Kevin McCarthy, and I'm sure he doesn't want to be subpoenaed either. So he had resisted this for a long time. I am glad that they've reached a, uh, uh, a deal, uh, and I look forward to making sure that that commission does the right thing uh, and doesn't allow this to be swept under the rug. And finally, I now want to play for you a 
devastating fact check from CNN's Daniel Dale, who is widely respected journalist and fact checker over there. And here he is uh, fact checking one of the most hated men in America who lives at the tippy top of bullshit mountain like the Scrooge looking down on anybody he can pump bullshit through unless he's jetting off to leave bullshit mountain uh, while it is frozen and wants to go to Cancun. Well, here's Ted Cruz getting fat checked by Daniel Dale. Senator Cruz falsely claimed this week that Democrats have made a proposal that is, quote, intended to register millions of undocumented immigrants to vote. Listen. This bill right now automatically registers to vote anyone who interacts with the government. So if you get a welfare check, if you get an unemployment check, if you get a driver's license, if you attend a public college or university, you're automatically registered to vote. Millions of illegal immigrants fall into those categories. It explicitly sets up a process to register those millions of illegal immigrants. None of what you just heard is correct. The Democrats' proposed election legislation explicitly says over and over that only American citizens would be eligible to get registered, just like under current law. Automatic voter registration does not mean literally everyone gets registered regardless of their immigration status. Here's how it does work. When a U.S. citizen has dealings with a government agency, from the DMV to a Medicaid office, they would automatically have their info sent to elections officials to get signed up to vote unless they decided to opt out. Under the Democratic bill, the info sent to elections officials would have to include information showing this person is a citizen. Now, Senator Cruz notes that the bill doesn't require people to provide hard proof that they're a citizen, that they're allowed to simply declare that they are. Well, here's some critical context. Only a declaration of citizenship is required today under existing federal law. And the declaration system works. Non-citizen face prison time and deportation if they lie about this, and fraud is extremely rare. Similarly, it is true that non-citizens sometimes mistakenly get registered under automatic voter registration, but such mistakes also happen sometimes without automatic voter registration. And we know that mistakes aren't a widespread problem under so-called AVR systems. More than a third of U.S. states from Georgia to Oregon already have AVR, and there's no sign that undocumented immigrants are being registered in large numbers in those states. In summary, again, Senator Cruz's claims are just plain incorrect oh what a fat check by cnn's daniel dale okay well that is the last 24 next up it's time for everything else in what i call the news dump and this week we've got new jingles from musician subscriber and stand-up listener the always amazing pete co Prowling tiger at the zoo, acting like a grump. The keeper now has less limbs on today's news dump. <laughs> well, that does bring me to one of the top stories of today's news dump. The most important, most consequential story in all of America. The missing tiger has been found. The alleged owner facing serious charges. Cub seen roaming in Houston is safe. Tiger that frightened residents after his last seen briefly wandering the Houston neighborhood has been found after nearly a week-long search and appears to be unharmed. Terror of the people of Houston is over. They don't have to worry about being attacked by a tiger or sending their kids outside to be attacked by a tiger. Now they can just be worried about the fact that they still live in Houston and they're going to melt all summer long. But don't worry, Texas, that leads me to my next story for you, which is coming from Politico, where the headline reads, Matthew McConaughey making calls as he weighs running for Texas governor. He's a beloved home state star, but pundits are skeptical that the acclaimed actor has a chance at unseating Republican Governor Greg Abbott. Well, when Politico reached out for comment, he apparently said, all right, all right, all right, he might, he might, he might. All right, that's horrible. So, so sorry I did that. You know what? If he's actually going to run as a Democrat to unseat uh, Governor Abbott, I would fully support him. Whatever it takes, Matthew McConaughey. I'm sure there's got to be somebody better. I nominate longtime listener and uh, very smart guy, Cornell Woolrich. How about that? He's running. Let's head out to Iowa where we can say hi to Kim Nyborg and... Mark Nolte, and who else is out there listening in Iowa? 
freight train hauling fertilizer derailed and caught fire in Iowa Sunday afternoon, sending plumes of smoke in the air. 18 cars were involved in the uh, incident that took place around 2 p.m. But a bystander, Mark Nolte, came in and hosed it all down and saved everybody. Oh, my God, Mark, that's you! No, you guys are okay, right? 18 cars were involved in the incident. took place around 2 p.m. There were no uh, immediate reports of injuries or deaths, uh, but nearby residents were evacuated. That's why I'm joking about it, because nobody died. But uh, crazy out there in Iowa. Hope everybody's okay. Well, you know where they weren't really okay? Uh, In Phoenix. Let's go to Arizona, where nearly two dozen people who were stranded after a roller coaster stalled mid-ride at an Arizona amusement park. They're okay. They're safe. But news reports and the Phoenix Fire Department say the ride at Castles and Coasters, that's the name of the place, Castles and Coasters in Phoenix, got stuck Saturday with riders perched 20 feet off the ground. Apparently, they are renaming the park uh, Castles and Courts because that's where they're going to be with all the lawsuits, huh? Castles and Cluster fu- Okay, moving on. Federal income tax filings and payments for individuals are due today. Deadlines in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana were extended until June 15th, but federal income tax filings and payments for individuals due today here on the 17th. Treasury Department and the IRS extended the deadline in March. So get your taxes done if you haven't already. Over the weekend, a horse beat another horse in a horse race, race, which is a thing that happens in America. But the horse that apparently was doing steroids uh, did not win. But I think all the horses do steroids, and that's really sad. But the horse uh, that won is Ron Bauer, and it uh, had 11-to-1 upset to win in the Preakness on Saturday. And Medina Spirit changed its name to Cancel Culture. So we'll see what happens next. The operator of the nation's largest gasoline pipeline that was hit with a ransomware cybertech says it has resumed normal operations as now delivering millions of gallons of fuel per hour, folks. Georgia-based Colonial Pipeline has begun the process of restarting the pipeline's operations on Wednesday evening, warning it could take several days for the supply chain to return to normal. But at least we got to talk about some lady filling plastic bags with gas, even though the video was from, like, years ago. And another reminder that we need to get off of gas. And on to cars that rely on hard-to-find microchips. <laughs> oh, and how about this big story over the weekend? China landed on, the, uh, on Mars in a major advance for their space ambitions. The Associated Press writes, China landed a spacecraft on Mars for the first time on Saturday, a technically challenging feat more difficult than the moon landing and the latest step forward for its ambitious goals in space. So now our rover is up there. And now they have a rover up there and China has uh, a footprint on Mars for the first time the US has had nine successful landings on Mars since 1976 Soviet Union landed on the planet in 1971 but the mission failed after the craft stopped transmitting information soon after touchdown a rover and a tiny helicopter from the American landing in February are currently exploring Mars as you probably read I mean a lot of you guys are really interested in this stuff and, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely interested in it, but some of you guys are, are paying attention to it all the time and making me aware of it, which is really cool. But NASA is now expecting the rover to collect it, its first sample in July to return to Earth in a decade. And uh, now they're concerned that sample uh, could have General So's chicken in it. I mean, actually, I don't even think General... Yeah, General So is not even a Chinese thing. I think we made that up here, so I don't know what other kind of Chinese thing I could have used for a joke. But I'm probably already in trouble for the General So comment. If so, write my uh, sponsors and my mom. And finally, I like this story. Uh, Historically black universities canceled $730,000 in student debt. According to CNN, Delaware State University is issuing relief for recent graduates who'd been hit particularly hard due to the pandemic. Doing so with the help of federal dollars provided through the American Rescue Plan for COVID-19 relief. Yeah, they use their COVID relief to cancel student debt. They could have done other things with it, of course. So uh, it's a pretty noble idea. In a statement, the university president, Tony Allen, said a significant step was taken in order to continue furthering the school's mission to help students change the economic trajectory of their lives. And that means not starting out their careers burdened with debt from their education. 
Okay, that is your news dump. I am now over 40 minutes into today's episode, so I think it's probably best I get to my first guest. I'm so happy to have you joining me to hear this conversation I had with her on Friday. She's uh, now a politician. She's a lawyer. She's a civil rights activist for criminal justice reform in specific. In 2011, she was sentenced to 30 months in prison for theft and drug crimes. 2017, though, she graduated from Seattle University School of Law with honors, but she couldn't be take the bar exam because she was a former felon. Well, guess what? She took that all the way to the Supreme Court and got it changed. And in November of this past year, she became the first person formally convicted of a felony elected to the Washington State Legislature. The newly elected Democrat now represents the 23rd District in Kitsap County, about 40 miles outside Tacoma. Ladies and gentlemen, she comes highly recommended from listeners like you. So let me know who you want me to have on the show, because I think it's Tina Winsett who gets credit for Tara Simmons joining me here now today. All of her information is in the show notes today and every day's podcast. You can find out about the guest, of course, in the show notes. She is on Twitter at Tara Simmons 5. And here we go. And I'm so glad that you are here Representative Tara Simmons, so great to get you on stand up. I'm really happy to, to get to have a conversation with you. Thank you so much, Pete. I am excited to be here. So what a life. I mean, had your first kid when you were a teenager and then you become addicted to drugs. You go to prison. You get out of prison. You work at Burger King. You, you go to law school. You go up in front of the Supreme Court to get your rights back. And then you get elected to state rep, do you ever look back at your, do you stop and look back at everything you've accomplished and, and say, oh my goodness, how did I rise from those ashes? I do. I do. It's a very humbling experience. I sometimes get overwhelmed with emotion and just gratitude for how far I've come. But I also just am not happy with accepting that I made it, you know, really just want to make sure that everybody has the same opportunities because it was so hard and not everybody has the same, like, you know, I won't say I had a lot of support because I don't have, you know, a strong family of origin, but I did have support from strangers and community and, you know, not everybody has that. And so I'm just, you know, really grateful for the opportunity that I get to keep fighting to make, you know, our criminal legal system more just and fair and to allow other people to have opportunities too. What was your childhood like? Where, what kind of like, where did you grow up? Most people probably don't know much about the state of Washington. I'm just making an assumption, but uh, what was your childhood like? Yeah, my childhood was really difficult. You know, my parents divorced when I was a year old. So my father lived in California. My mom lived here in Washington and I would go back and forth between the two of them. Mm. And they both struggled with substance use disorder and they were both, you know, of very modest means. My father was absolutely poor and you know, so living in environments where there was a lot of violence and crime and my parents struggling with addiction led to early childhood, adverse childhood experiences and difficulties. So I, you know, and I would run away from home. I, you know, was trafficked as a young girl. I um, got pregnant at 14. I, and I was also the first person in my family to ever even graduate high school. You know, nobody in my family, my father got a GED in juvenile prison. But so that was kind of my childhood. Do you have siblings? I do. I have a, a half sister from my mom and two half brothers from my father. Um, one of my brothers is still cycling in and out of prison mm. uh, right now to this day. And fortunately, my sister, you know, saw, you know, my success and followed in my footsteps. And now, you know, she did go to juvenile prison, but she now has a bachelor's degree and is working in a prison, helping other women coming out. That's and, awesome. And through education. So, yeah. When you say you were trafficked, what does that mean? I was kidnapped and forced into prostitution at um, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know how my daughters are 13 and 16. Um, how, how, how did you possibly get out of that or recover from that? What does that do to someone who barely knows anything about life? 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a really long journey, to tell you the truth. I um, still to this day, you know, go to therapy every week. That, you know, was just one of the difficulties I faced in my life. I've, you know, gone through a lot of trauma. And so, you know, I think it definitely, you know, still affects me to this day. And I have to utilize tools to even stay calm and present and in my body in these legislative conversations that I'm having that are dealing with, you know, these issues. And, you know, I think that is one of the things that gives me a real heart for reform in the criminal legal system is that everybody I knew in prison had these traumatic experiences. And I know that they're not bad people, right? We react in our trauma in different ways with violence, with addiction, uh, and then we criminalize that and put people into cages where they're mo- more trauma. And and we can do so much better if everyone had access to a great therapist like I do. Hmm. <laughs> we'd, be, yeah. we'd be good. Yeah. It's, it's so often it's about resources and, and, and having access to them, opportunity to have access to them. But, you know, when you say we're not bad people, it's it's so easy. And I've been hearing this for my whole career in media and talking about politics. And I want to I really want to get your take on it. It's really easy for people who haven't had those experiences or arguably even those who have. I mean, this is I think the story that resonates the most is, you know, I grew up with all kinds of challenges. I I, I grew up in poverty. Now look at me. I own my own business. I'm very successful. It can be done. You just have to make better choices. Nothing bothers me or irks me or makes me more infuriated than when people boil down these type of adverse experiences in and entire childhoods and, and, and lives to bad choices. So so my question to you is, did you make a bad choice when you had sex, when you got pregnant, when you're a teenager? Did you make a bad choice when you were when you got addicted to drugs? Did you make a bad choice at any of these points? Do you how do you see that kind of uh, I call it a myth, but that kind of argument about just mm-hmm. have be more personally responsible and make bad choices. You know, you don't do these things and you won't be in trouble. Yeah. You know, I think it's um, really easy for people from the outside who don't know to make that argument, but when they don't know the choices presented before you. So did I make a choice, a bad choice to get pregnant at 14? Well, let's see, my choices were either to sleep on the park bench or go home with the Navy guy and sleep with him. You know what I mean? Like at 14 years old. I don't. No, I don't know what you mean. And I don't think (laughs) anybody knows that. I know that that's just a phrase, but I mean, no, that's the issue. We don't know what, (laughs) what it's like to be in that situation. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we can judge people's choices, right? You know, a lot of times for people that use drugs, their choices to either like go commit a homicide because they're so angry or, you know, like use some drugs to calm them down or, you know, they don't have a choice to like appropriate healthcare. Right. And they don't have a choice to, uh, they try maybe to reach out for healthcare and there's so many barriers to accessing it that they give up. I mean, you have to really look at the choices presented that people have when judging whether they made a bad choice. You know, I mean, I take responsibility for some of the decisions I made, but my responsibility is, you know, what I'm doing now to really uh, try to make amends and and make our communities safer. But, uh, you know, I mean, even that, when you say I take responsibility for some of the decisions I made, it's like, well, you, you already gave me one example. It's like, the decisions are that you make and the choices that you make are based on the options that you have. And I think people don't people just don't realize that we just every nobody has the same set of options. Nobody mm-hmm. has the same list of choices and decisions they can make. And it's, it's a weird thing when we assume that we all we all have the same situations and, and, and the same opportunities that we can all make these choices. When you made decisions, bad decisions, people might say it might just be between three horrible choices that you have and no others. Right. That is absolutely correct. And I see that over and over again. What happened with your arrest and incarceration? This was for drugs usage, selling. I mean, how did you get addicted to drugs? Well, I mean, my addiction to drugs probably, you know, started a lot, many years before I actually went to prison. You know, there was times in my life where I was able to, uh, you know, find enough 
you know, other options to kind of avoid drugs for a while. You know, I never got into like recovery or anything like that until I went to prison. But, you know, this particular time, you know, I was taking prescribed drugs that a doctor had given me because I fell down some stairs and got hooked on opiates. And another doctor was giving me Adderall because I was tired from the opiates and, you know, trying to function. And so I was taking this like legal, like, you know, downers and uppers, downers and uppers. It was kind of wild actually. And then, you know, my father passed away and, you know, all of my family is drug users. So my, you know, aunt started coming around and she was using methamphetamine and using it right in front of me. And, you know, I probably made a bad decision during that time and, you know, wanted to take away the pain and my prescription drugs weren't doing enough. And I really wasn't thinking completely because I was on a lot of prescription drugs. And so I started using meth with my aunt and, you know, I, you know, once I started, it was like, I couldn't stop. I I tried, I wanted to, but there's this problem in America where drugs are illegal. And so there's a lot of stigma around it. And I remember like wanting to call and try to get into rehab, but then I was afraid because I was a registered nurse at the time. And I was afraid I would lose my nursing license. And I was afraid, you know, that they would report me to the nursing board. And I remember that being like a a real barrier. And then the stigma, you know, not wanting to tell my like doctor because, you know, not knowing if they're going to call the police, you're already kind of paranoid when you're on drugs, you know? And so I think, you know, the criminalization of drug possession is really hindering people getting into services and help when they need it. So anyway, I, you know, ended up like selling some of my prescription drugs to get uh, illegal drugs. And and there I was, 30 month sentence. I skipped the part that you were a registered nurse. Forgive me earlier. Uh, but yeah, w- what's okay. uh yeah, super important. You were arrested. And I mean, how did that how did you get arrested for it? Because I think that's something that happens a lot. Oh, yeah. You know, police use, you know, other people who've been caught, right, to do in in controlled buys. And that's what they did for me. And then, uh, you know, raided my uh, the place I was staying and, you know, uh, in charge me with the delivery and then, you know, possession of drugs, possession of marijuana, all, all kinds of different charges. And what I wanted to say about that is that they, they also offered me if I would, you know, become an informant for them that it would all go away. But I just wasn't willing to do that. Why weren't you willing to make, speaking of choices and decisions, that's a tough position that of course they put you in to, uh, to rat on somebody else. Like you, why did you not want to, you obviously took the, uh, the option uh, to, to be put in the system and, and, and uh, eventually in prison. Why, why not do take that deal? Well, I mean, I think, For me, you know, I mean, there was like a a belief system about, you know, doing those types of things and creating harm on other people instead of taking responsibility for Mm. my conduct. And then there's also an element of fear for doing those things and and seeing violence against my own children or something, you know. By the way, can we agree at this point? Maybe there's some hypothetical I've never thought of, but I I feel like everybody should agree that. The idea that drug possession is a crime is inhumane and immoral. We can talk about selling drugs. I mean, I think that everything should be legalized, but we can talk about selling drugs. We can have that argument. But I feel like drug possession, especially marijuana at this point, is is insane that that is illegal to possess or even use drugs because of some of the things you already said. We agree on that, right? Like around. Oh, yeah, we absolutely agree with that. In fact, I just left legislative session where this issue was took up majority of my time. What are the arguments? What do you run into with 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 possession? Just focus on that with with the people who want to keep that a crime or make even make it a worse crime. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really difficult. I mean, they, you know, believe for some reason they don't understand the mere possession is not the um, stealing, the driving under the influence, the uh, selling. You know, they they don't understand. Right. A lot of people in our world don't necessarily understand the conduct of drug possession and the barriers. They're just not educated enough. And then I will say, you know, police really like that tool because then it allows them to do search and other kinds of policing, right? Yep. Uh, 
they can search you incident to arrest and then, you know, find out other things or it allows them to, you know, police. <laughs> You're right. It allows them to do a lot of things that that they shouldn't be allowed to do, frankly. So. Yeah. So you get sentenced to 30 months. Yes. You served the whole 30 months. I served 20 months. Uh, I got a third off for good time. What was your incarceration experience like? What can we learn from what you learned inside? Well, I mean, it's a horrible experience, especially if you're a parent, right? And you, uh, your, your children are suffering because of the absence as well. And, you know, it's a dehumanizing place. You know, all women. All I was with all women. Yes. Uh, you know, they do strip searches and, um, you know, they'll roll you out at two o'clock in the morning and strip search you if they want, you know, just because somebody on the pod might have had something they weren't supposed to have. Or, you know, there wasn't even any drugs in my prison. It was like, you know, if you have a hair clip <laughs> or something, you know, it, so it was it, it definitely was not a very good experience. And there wasn't any programming where I was at. So it's not like, you know, you were sitting there bettering your life, really. Um, there there was some volunteer programs that came in, which I was very grateful for. And that's the first time I got exposed to recovery. And, you know, and so, I mean, there were some periods of time where I was able to sit and reflect and journal and like process some trauma and realize that, you know, the reason I was using drugs was directly related to my childhood uh, trauma and kind of try to heal that on my own. But it wasn't like a therapeutic place, you know, where people are really getting rehabilitated. And I did make some lifelong friends who are, are still friends today. But oh, that's interesting. What Was there an experience during that time or any time before that was really that really changed the trajectory of your life? Because, I mean, that's generally, I think, you know, forgive my assumptions, but what happens is most people stay in these generational situations of, of generational trauma, oppression, violence, addiction, and it, it often obviously coincides with with poverty. Um, so it's an economic issue. But w- w- at what point or was there a series of is- of experiences, of people or anything mm-hmm. that changed your trajectory where you said, you know what, I want to go to law school when I get out of here? Absolutely. One of the volunteer programs that came in was a group of law students. And one of them had become an attorney during her time there when she was coming in to volunteer and was helping me with my child custody issue. Um, Because, you know, you go to prison, you have all kinds of other legal issues that arise. And, And it was those volunteer attorneys who told me that they thought I would be a good lawyer hmm. and gave me the name of a law professor who I could call when I got out to see what the chances of me becoming a lawyer were based on my criminal history. And so definitely meeting them there and they're still lifelong friends and we still do advocacy work together to this day and are in close contact. And, and then the, you know, 12 step recovery program that came in, uh, you know, one of the women there became my sponsor and I'm still in contact with her today too. So I guess, you know, I did meet some volunteers in connection. So how long then did you, go to law school like how what was that like and 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 then because it brings us to the point where you what you couldn't take the bar right yeah absolutely so i got out of prison in 2013 and started at law school in 2014 and you know during a big part of my story i don't know if you've ever met sean hopwood but if you haven't, you should. I don't think so. Uh, he's, uh, yeah, jailhouse lawyer, was a student at University of Washington Law School when I started. Now he's a professor at Georgetown. Uh, but he, you know, had robbed five banks and served 12 years in federal prison. Oh my God. And he was a, a law student here right by me in Seattle. And anyway, uh, we have a, a pretty cool story uh, in that that is uh, alone its own story. But Uh, You know, I went to law school and did everything I was supposed to do, graduated near the top of my class, you know, Dean's Medal, first Skadden Fellow ever from my school in 35 years, had been appointed by the governor to boards and commissions, had started a nonprofit, had done all this you know, really great work. And and yeah, the Bar Association wouldn't let me sit for the exam when I graduated in 2017. Did you anticipate that? Did you know that that was going to be an issue? Well, I knew that it could be an issue. However, I had done everything to address the root causes of my crimes. And, you know, Sean Hopwood, you know, 
five armed bank robberies, 12 years in federal prison, had already gotten through the Washington State Bar and became an attorney. And then they denied me. So anyway, he came back from Washington, D.C. to to represent me in the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. And uh, just to be clear that uh, I didn't get that detail, they they wouldn't allow you to take the bar because you were you'd been a a convicted felon, right? That's the that yeah. was the law. The argument apparently didn't take that long in front of the the Washington State Supreme Court. Is that right? No, yeah, they denied me in April. We got before the court in November, and usually it takes four or five months before you get a decision out of the court. But before the end of the day on November sixteenth, twenty seventeen, the court unanimously decided that I should be able to sit for the bar. Does that then change the law for everybody behind you, or is it just well, we've taken a look at her situation and make made an exception? Yeah, that's the problem. Is that it still does not change for everybody, right? It, now it sets a precedent and a Supreme Court opinion, which we haven't had that you know gives better chances, but it's still not. It's an it's still an individualized rule. It's such a grotesque thing to if someone serves their time, which I, I mean, I have all kinds of thoughts about. It. I mean, I'm pretty radical. I, I, the incarceration and in I mean, it's all horrible to me. But but if you serve your time and then you go to school, you put yourself through law school and now you can't be a lawyer. I mean, th- and that's not even that common, probably. Right. I mean, the more important rights are like the right to vote, housing, all kinds of other opportunities. They make the system makes it so hard, so much harder to get back into good standing to make a living to support your family. It's far easier to go back to crime. And that's a lot of what you learn how to do while you're in. I mean, that's mm-hmm. basically it seems like a lot of your life's work as a legislator is to help people get their rights back after they've served time. How am I doing? Is that right? Oh yes, absolutely. And yeah, the the law you know, bar admission is, like you said, it's a very, very small amount of people that need that. And it's a huge privilege, right? And, but yes, I'm working on policies right now to just help people become in-home care providers for their dying grandma because they had a 20-year-old conviction, right? It's oh. uh, it's ridiculous that you, we have these laws, all of these collateral consequences that impact. I So to, to tell you the truth, like today I am an attorney, I'm a legislator and I can't go on a field trip with my kids. Like it is ridiculous. And, and how does that affect my children? Right? Like it is hurting the children. And this is how we get the generational cycles. Well, that all depends kids, on if your kids want you on that field yeah. trip. Maybe it's not. <laughs> I don't want yeah. you to be a chaperone, mom. Come on. That is yeah. horrific. That I mean, that's just one awful example. But there are so many other things that you're a, a state legislator and you can't sh- you would be the very best person to be on that bus as a role model for every kid to see. And they're stealing that. They're stealing yes. it from the kids. Absolutely. Yep. And it, it is. It's hurting our kids. And there's, you know, kids with special needs who like need their parents to show up at school and so many, so many issues. Um, but yeah, the housing one is a big one. I'm, I'm planning to tackle that come January. So give me an example. Like what happens? You, you, you get out of prison. You want to, I mean, what are some of the, the situations that people run into? Yeah. I mean, you are trying to rent a very, you know, meager apartment, right? Uh, Because you can't find a lot of employment opportunities, you know, and you're working for minimum wage. This was my experience uh, working you know, at a fast food restaurant. Uh, they're garnishing part of my paycheck to pay my court fines and fees. And Wait, you got, so you, when even, you get out, you get a job at a fast food restaurant and they're taking part of your, whatever it is, seven bucks? Yep. To, to, How it can was you $9. possibly ever get back to anything you can't yeah and then you can't by the way qualify for other assistance either right often no No. yeah sometimes yeah public benefits you can't qualify for because (sighs) of restrictions there so you know i was trying to rent a very you know meager apartment and you know trying to get back together with my children and you know housing is like number one priority and um you know, just the barriers that people would take your $40 to run a credit back background check. And you might even tell them up front, you know, I have a criminal history, but well, we want to do the background check first and then we'll let you know. Right. And 
you know, constant denials, you know, and you can't even afford those $40 credit checks, you know? Um, yeah. So, we don't think of any of those things. We don't think of any of those things, not to mention, you know, we haven't even started talking about healthcare uh, yeah. or, you know, other educational opportunities. So you're yeah. now a, a, a legislator. You're in the, the state of Washington, uh, state house. You're an elected mm-hmm. legislator. And I, I, you know, what I'm most curious about really, and I know you've talked about this before, obviously, but how the effect that you're having on your colleagues there, your story is, is, is so important. And I think it's also really important that I know, I guess you identify as white and Hispanic, but you mm-hmm. look like a white person. And I think that matters. Mm-hmm. And I think I wonder, because you also have two sons who are black and mm-hmm. it, it matters, I think, for white folks to convince other white folks that they can mm-hmm. kind of identify with. And and, and, and uh, I mean, how important, how much of a difference have you made or inroads have you made on on other legislature le- legislators, lawmakers based on your experience and, and, and who you are and what you look like? I, I think that seems yeah. to matter. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely have been very influential in helping to educate my colleagues. And, you know, I'm also, you know, a a real good team player and I genuinely love people. So I think I have really good relationships with my colleagues and they've been willing to listen and have really thanked me. And, um, we, you know, this year we got our, uh, the voting rights bill through, I mean, it was a partisan issue, um, almost the whole way with just one Republican voting for it. But, you know, we, Reenfranchised, um, you know, 26,000 people in our state immediately who were on community custody or living in a um, work release house or, That's you huge. know, um, and I think, you know, I did was able to pull votes of people who previously wouldn't vote for that uh, because we had tried for several years and it had failed. Um, and we got that through this year. Uh, so how, how, do, do you use the uh, the argument, the fiscal uh, argument with 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 these folks because sometimes that seems to resonate with with folks on the right. You're wasting so much money on the way in, on the way out, uh, and you can make people productive citizens if you would just change this or, or, or that. They're they're so worried about you know the money, and yet they're wasting so much by putting people in cages. Does that argument resonate? You know, sometimes it does, but uh, you know, I I haven't seen a lot of. Um, mm-hmm. Movement on that. I will say, you know, I'm working on the court fines and fees issue too, and and that in that context, I I think I am building some bipartisan support there. Um, but you know, I find that we just have a, a fundamental like difference on um, what is a just and proportionate sentence in a lot of times, and you know, a, a lot of my colleagues that don't, don't agree with me just really think that you know, putting people in in prison for life. They don't believe that people can change. They don't care about the backstory. Um, it's, it's really hmm. sad a lot of times. Yeah, it um, is. And I always feel like it just is like so much about punishment. There's this yeah. kind of almost biblical rooted yeah. idea and punishing people who do bad things and just putting them away and, 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 and get them out of our sight and punish them. They should have made better choices. And it's like, that's just so 300 years ago. <laughs> Yeah. And, and for me, I'm like, what about the, that's like the old Testament, but what about yeah. the new Testament? Right. Those are like Jesus dying on the cross and said, forgive him. He doesn't know, you know, like what, what's all that about? Sure, what's all sure. the redemption? Where's the redemption piece? Right. How does that argument work out for you? Uh, redemption is so important. It's so, you yeah. know, forgiveness and redemption is, is, yeah, it's also rooted in a lot of religions and yet it's not applied uh, when it comes to these laws. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's discouraging. What, what more can what, what more can we you know, are, are you doing in terms of uh, drug laws or, or police accountability? Um, and, and then maybe we get, you know, I, I think that I heard this and you say oh. this uh, in preparation to talk to you today to just striking at the root of the problem. We never talk about the root of the problem, which is almost always poverty and also racism. Yep, absolutely. Uh, You know, I, this session was a big session for us in the drug war also in that our state Supreme court on February 25th actually found our drug possession statute unconstitutional um, because it did not have a mens rea element to it. So you didn't have to know you were in possession. We were the only state in the nation that had this unconstitutional strict liability statute still in the books. So the Supreme court struck it down February 25th. And so we spent, the last two months of session, 
um, figuring out what we were going to do in response to this um, because we had to do something because local jurisdictions, counties and cities were now passing ordinances, making it a gross misdemeanor. So we actually, you know, I fought tooth and nail. I was on the leadership team for the, the Democratic caucus um, trying to decriminalize drug possession here in Washington and fought tooth and nail to the end. And we ended up getting a, a simple misdemeanor, which is less than a felony, less than a gross misdemeanor. Um, but we have two law enforcement assisted diversions in it. Now, before you can even charge a misdemeanor, law enforcement twice has to divert people to services and help. So, and, and we have a sunset on this law for in two years. Good. So we're definitely going to be working more on the drug war here in Washington. And my hope is to go to Portugal and to come back and to mm. really move this towards uh, decriminalization. Because of Portugal uh, has decriminalized years ago and the, and, yeah. and the, the, the outcome has been amazing. I mean, there's no perfect yeah. policy, but of course, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're definitely working on that. And police accountability, we did a ton this session. We, you know, established use of force standards. We created a statewide independent investigation oversight um, uh, office for any use of force. We have decertification of police officers now. They're going to have to be certified and decertified. And so they can't go to another jurisdiction and work yeah. if they are decertified. Uh, we did a lot and we banned uh, chokeholds and tear gas and um, all kinds of different tactics um, by police in Washington. You know, it's, it's interesting that issue of police officers doing uh, horrible things and <clears throat> getting fired or kicked off the force and then going to another force is really interesting in comparison to your story. Like you do every, you, you get caught w whatever, you know, for a, a, a crime that shouldn't be a crime. You get sent to prison, you come out and now there's all these restrictions against you to make a better life, but there aren't restrictions against police officers who do terrible things from working on other, you know, at other police stations. And don't get me started yeah. on, on priests yeah. that they move around. Uh, yeah. But, but I mean, it's just a, it's an interesting juxtaposition to, to see how, how much, how much more difficult they make it for you and folks who have been through what you through than police officers who, who uh, get fired <laughs> from their, their police. For department. killing someone. <laughs> yeah. For killing someone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, listen, I'll let you go, but I, I really mm. appreciate the time and your story, and I'm super excited to see whatever comes up next for you and uh, want to talk to you, have a continuing conversation with you and all about all the great work that you're doing out there. And hopefully uh, other people see it and copy it. And I'm sure that you're happy to share all of the solutions that work. So thank you so much for talking yeah. to me today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pete. And thank you for recommending that she join me on the program. If you know somebody who's inspiring and hardworking and has overcome a lot of adversity to create change, to stand up, then I'd love to hear about that person. Maybe that person's you. Tell me your story. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com to suggest any guests anytime. Last week, we learned about India Walton for the first time. She's running to be the mayor of Buffalo, and she joined me on the podcast. Well, on Thursday night, I invited her to hang out with us at the Stand Up Community Subscriber Happy Hour Hangout. What do we call it? That's a long name. The Happy Hour Hangout, which we do with Stand Up Subscribers every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. So sign up now and join us because India Walton did. After she was my guest, she then came out with us on, I say out with us, hung out with us online virtually uh, on Thursday night. We had a, a great conversation and some fun listeners asked questions. And so just continued the conversation that I started with her and decided I'd throw it on today's episode along with Tara Simmons, because both these women have some similar issues that they've dealt with in their lives and have overcome and are both trying to create big change and stand up. And I love telling their stories and learning about them and so happy that we had India join us for the hangout. So here is subscriber hangout with India Walton from last Thursday night. And you can go to IndiaWalton.com to donate to her campaign if you like. Okay, so in, in moments, <laughs> India Walton is going to join. Oh, there she is. She's coming right now. She's just, she's signing in. There's no way to stop it. I can't stop it. And then, uh, you know, introduce her. But but hopefully you heard her joining me on the program. Yes. And... She is running for mayor of Buffalo. Let me record this mofo in case any goldness comes out of it. Um, oh, and then there I am already swearing. And India's there. 
India Walton, everybody. Get shower your hands because you can't hear everybody. Welcome to Stand Up, and thank you very much for joining. AJ, I did not see you. I mean, come, good lord. I mean, what kind of a what kind of a Nancy Pelosi to Trump uh, State of the Union clap was that right there? Uh, that was so great. Um, so thank you very much, India, for joining us tonight. We're very excited to have you. And I am going to very quickly, I am not prepared at all yet. Um, oh my God, my dad's calling. Everything is chaotic. Dad, I'm zooming with India Walton, who's going to be the next mayor <laughs> of Buffalo, New York. And I just want to get the link in here to make sure that anybody who wants to donate to her campaign can. This is the first time I've done this. I've wanted to do this for other candidates, but I just didn't. But I am very excited to do it for her because she really blew my mind uh, given her life story. But more importantly, like, yeah, she looked really very interesting and impressive on paper. But when I talked to her, I just learned so much and got such a great perspective. And I don't know, I felt like, Indy, I don't know how you felt. Hopefully you were, you had fun, but I felt like we were old friends. It felt good to talk to you. And I was really happy to be able to share a conversation. So welcome to joining us. We won't take up too much of your time, but we're so psyched to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I had a, I had a great time. You know, I didn't know quite what to expect. It's like ah, campaigning for with a comedian. I don't know. If that's going to. Um, but, you know, it, it was a great conversation and it was a nice break from the normal interview style that that I've been grinding out bumping out the last six months <laughs> good good i'm really glad you felt that way you know we got to talk for a long time and we got to talk about a larger range of issues really got to know you and i would have loved to heard the in, the internal conversation like where are we gonna where are we gonna put our candidate we're gonna put our kid with who is this guy he was the fluffer at the daily show uh what wait, <laughs> he's peed on the street he punches like this we let's everybody uh maybe we shouldn't do this but i'm i'm psyched you you jumped in the deep end with me. We had an, I, I learned a lot. We had an awesome conversation and uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes of your time. I just and I'll record this and share it as well. But I want to I want to ask you one main question that we didn't get to. And then I would love to open it up to this amazing group of people and Jason Moe. And uh, and he didn't even hear it. Did you hear it? dude? You didn't hear it. OK, you got it. OK. Uh, and uh, hopefully other people have uh, questions. Oh, I just saw Kate Wyatt joined us. Oh, my God. I'm so excited to have everybody here. OK, so. All right, Andy, I wanted to just talk to you about criminal justice reform, which is a huge subject. And I always break it up into, you know, what makes a, a community a community? Uh, what happens in an arrest? What happens after the arrest? What happens in a trial? And then, of course, incarceration. And then, of course, everything after that, probation and, and, and losing your rights and gaining your rights. So I just want to open it up to you in terms of generally, what have you worked on? What have you gotten done as a community organizer? And what would you do as, as mayor of Buffalo? And obviously, I'm, I'm sure it relates uh, in, in a lot of ways to, to communities that many of us live in. But criminal justice reform. What, what, what are you what are you thinking? How's it going? What, what do you want to do? Yeah, my first organizing job was working on criminal justice reform and um, especially in a community that's as conservative as Buffalo. It wasn't really a hot topic at the time. And I think that, you know, we are enjoying some of the momentum and energy around the uprisings of last summer. And we're seeing a lot of um, progressive changes happen. Um, I mean, I worked on everything from bail reform to police accountability and transparency. Um, but my crowning achievement is being on the forefront um, of the campaign to mer to legalize adult use cannabis in New York State. Uh, that, that was work that I had done when people were still saying that it, it wasn't ever going to happen. Um, and now that we're seeing this legal market, I'm excited to be in the running, to be in leadership in Buffalo to make sure that as we see tax revenues come in and as we see licensing and, you know, local laws govern the way this program is going to be rolled out, that I will have a say in ensuring that the people who've been most harmed by prohibition are the folks in the communities who get to benefit most from it. That's awesome. That's well, I think, yeah, what you're saying is uh, uh, 
marijuana cannabis companies come in to different communities and they might make a whole bunch of money and they're not making it off people who live necessarily locally, much less people who have been penalized or had issues with it. So that that's a, a, a I didn't explain it very well, but that's something that a lot of activists are doing to make sure that that it's a win win and that you, you don't get penalized if you. If you were, uh, you know, arrested or uh, somehow punished because of it in in the community, anyway, that's awesome and that's huge. But what what do you see as the issue, you know, right now in your community that's happening? And if you could snap your fingers, you would change in terms of policing or in terms of, you know, you mentioned the other day we didn't get to get into it. I didn't follow up, but community centers and things when you put them in your community. Uh, teenagers like me, I got in trouble a lot as a teenager because I didn't have anywhere to be. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, my parents weren't home. And so what do you see happening in Buffalo right now that you, if you could snap your fingers, you'd, you'd, you'd want to change it if you had the resources and the way to do it? Yeah, with this funding that's coming in from the Fed for, uh, through the CARES Act, there's going to be opportunities to really make the investments in our community that's going to reduce crime. One other thing that's happening that's really exciting right now is there is a ballot initiative to have a charter amendment that would establish an independent civilian oversight board for the police that has subpoena power and that can recommend discipline when officers um, behave in a way that's not in keeping with their oath to the community. Well, that was very um, that was very highbrow that statement. Behaving in a way that is not in keeping with the oath of their community. You, you that was thoughtful. That was very generous. Because I'm, I want, I'm trying. Well, I want to ask you. I mean, have you, it, it, it might be. Have you thought about if you're if you're the mayor of Buffalo, uh, you're. I don't know if you're technically in charge of the police, but you certainly have uh, a, a very important relationship then with police officers. What has your experience been in terms of interaction with law enforcement in the past? And and what would it be like to be basically in charge of them in a way? Yeah. So as as mayor, I'm in charge of the police commissioner. There you go. Um, And, you know, hey, coming from an executive position, if people aren't doing their jobs, they have to go. Right. There's no excuse for that, especially when a person is appointed by the mayor. If the commissioner can't discipline the officers if the commissioner cannot have officers um, implement and abide by the policies that are set forth, then something leadership has to change. Right. But, you know, I will say that as a worker, I didn't, I never liked it when the administration changed our workflow without consulting us. My relationship with police has not been contentious. When I have interactions with police as a citizen, you know, I speak truth to power, but we can come to an understanding. And I want to bring more of that into everyday interactions, right? When you have residency requirements and officers live in the communities they serve, instead of coming from the suburbs and, you know, wanting to have domination and, and police instead of, you know, coming in acts of service and, and in community and care and love, then that's how you begin to shift the culture by having people who are actually invested in the communities. I have two more questions and I'd love to turn it over to folks. If anybody has a question, you can, uh, I guess, however you raise your hand on zoom, I see Randolph and melody. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, you can also raise it and just jump in. Anyway, my first question or my uh, first of, last two here is what has your relationship been with the black lives matter movement and Buffalo or nationwide? And and how do you describe what that movement hopes to achieve? Mm -hmm. We touched on this um, a little bit before, but what I appreciate so much about the black lives matter movement is that it does not depend on a single charismatic leader, right? You don't know who the leader is. It's it's so diffuse that it's difficult to target one person to be able to squash it. So I think that's the one thing. Um, But for me, I think it's a broader understanding, right? So when I think about Black Lives Matter, it's not only police reform, but it's how we make meaningful investments in communities and in people, how we address um, Black maternal mortality and morbidity, how we address gaps in the um, the wealth gap and home ownership gap, and how we use, you know, poverty elimination tactics to really improve the lives of people of color and poor people, you know, at the, the municipal, state, and even federal level. 
I think you answered my second question. Let me let me turn it over to folks that are hanging out with us tonight, and we're very excited to have you here, India. It's great to see you again uh, twice in one week. It's so great to to meet you, and hopefully we can raise some money for your campaign tonight as well. If you want to support India, you can go into the chat where there is a link. It's also in uh, today's post, I think. If not, it will be in tomorrow's. Randolph is on the road, uh, and we sh- I feel the need to explain that Randolph is an over-the-road truck driver, and while he joins us here on Zoom, he is also on a stationary bike of some sort, and that that's what's happening there. So, okay. all right, I know it's it may seem what the hell is this guy doing, and that's a fair question. He is an amazingly healthy man. Randolph, you're up. India, I was listening to you and Pete while I was driving through Iowa. Uh, to Wyoming, and I was just so excited. I turned the truck around to drive to Buffalo to work for you. <laughs> and, but I'm sorry, I sold out. The Ohio governor announced a million dollar lottery, and I'm not going to make it as far as Buffalo. So I'm changing <laughs> residency to Ohio to win the million. But if I win, I promise I'll give you half of it, okay? I love that. Please do. <laughs> And I, in turn, will give it away, probably, most likely. Yeah, I think the maximum donation is $5,200, I think. I think that's what you said. So you can give anywhere from five to 5200 Did you have a question, Randolph, or you just want to tell I did, I did. Yeah. Affordable housing. We uh, lower-income people are being forced out of the places where we work. Uh, what are some specific ideas that you have for turning the tide around so we can afford to live? Yeah, Randolph, that is a great question. So I I say um, it's my jam all the time. Like policing is my jam. Affordable housing is my jam. And it's because I've done so many different things in my short life. Like I'll see a problem and I'm like, oh, here's an idea. And then I go do the thing. So um, my last job was actually as executive director of an organization I co-founded called the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust. And what community land trusts do is they use neighborhood-based housing hyper local, um, deeply democratic processes to determine how housing is developed, what type of housing. So in less than two years, I was able to raise a million dollars, build two houses and put 50 units of permanently affordable housing in the pipeline. And it will remain affordable in perpetuity and under the control of the community in perpetuity. And how you do that is you have um, a tripartite board where um, two thirds of the membership comes from the community that, that makes the decisions together about how development happens. So as mayor, I am really interested in expanding opportunities for cooperative development of housing, um, social housing and permanently affordable housing and really allowing opportunities for people to become homeowners because we know that the cost burden of homeownership is far less than that of renters. My so, Lord, that was an amazing, like who, my my impression of that interaction was Randolph asked about affordable housing and India had an entire plan that she had actually already accomplished. <laughs> that was awesome. Well done. Well done. Oh my gosh, Randolph, great question too. Melody, you have a question, a, a comment for India Walt News. And by the way, India, I, I should say it's about to get very fun because I'm just going to ask you a lightning round of stupidity. Like if you only had one album to listen to and your favorite food or something like that, we'll, we'll have some fun here. So uh, I'll let that. you relax a little bit. Melody, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, fine. Um, I, I actually lived in Buffalo for a very, very long time. Um, I live in upstate New York, only on the other end of New York now. Um, I miss Buffalo terribly, I will admit. Even though I was from the West Coast, I was dragged to Buffalo. The people in Buffalo are very, very, very friendly. I miss them. And I'm just saying that taking on a female mayor is probably the best move they've ever made. And I wish I was there to. uh, Yeah, very nice. You will be the first woman to be the mayor of Buffalo if if you win. I will be the first. But she can't do it without a donation. Give her a couple bucks, everybody. You guys are very generous people. So if you can, send her money and your money will go to. How do you use the money and how much of an issue is this? This is one of the, I told you, like, running for office, it's like, it's terrible. That, it, that That's a terrible part that you have to raise money. The best part is getting out and meeting people and creating change, I'm sure. But the idea that you got to raise money and, 
And sometimes you got to, I mean, there's no way. There's just no way to not be a little fake sometimes. You'd be like, yeah, I really don't like you, but I definitely need your money. So go ahead and make a donation. You don't need to comment on that. But um, uh, I think uh, I'm going to go to Dan, uh, Dan McDonald. Go ahead, buddy. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Mayor Walton. Yeah, I appreciate your sounds time good. On. That's what I said. She's the mayor already. Uh, so a quick question. So um, it's my understanding that uh, Tesla, right, by way of Solar Cities, is a major employer in, in, in oh. Buffalo. So my question is, would you accept Dogecoin as a form of tax payment from them <laughs> uh, since, uh, since uh, Elon Musk said that he's, he will no longer use uh, Bitcoin to pay for things? Do you have um, any other questions, you <laughs> asshole? Yeah, the, the the other question is, uh, will you commit right now to bar that dolt from your city? <laughs> so, do you have thoughts on Elon Musk, India? I, 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 I do have thoughts on Elon Musk. Funny you should ask. So, Dan, you should, what you should know is that I have thoughts on most things. Um, so when Elon Musk was preparing for his Saturday Night Live, he sort of tweeted like, oh, what, what should my skit be? And I'm like refund the Buffalo billion. So Elon Tesla is not a major employer in the Buffalo area. They okay. got not like $750 million to build this plant and they employ a um, hundred people and half of them are temporary employees with no benefits, no pension, no longevity, no union. So like, nah, I'm not accepting wow. anything from Elon Musk, but our money back. So oh I'm my God. Really I'm glad I asked. I'm awesome. falling Thank in you. deep love with this woman. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, does anybody else have a question before I go to our lightning round of ridiculousness? Anybody else want to jump in? Uh, yeah, yeah. She's awesome. Rory. Yeah, uh, India, great stuff. Great listening to you. I was curious when when you become mayor, do you think you'll have any inroads with the basically the uh, qualified uh, immunity that the police have, which seems to be the biggest shield to have any kind mm. of reform? Uh, is it are the people in Buffalo or the unions amenable to that? Out there, what's the the mood? So oh, the, the union of uh, so the purpose of the union is to protect the worker, right? Like I don't believe that the police union is inherently evil. They're doing their job, right? When I was a nurse with eleven ninety nine, the job of my union was protect was to protect me as a worker. But I keep saying like we had a committee called labor management where labor and management work together to find the best solutions and these things cannot be done without the help of police and i think that the police who are good officers don't want their reputations mired by those who are not and i will also say that um you know it's going to require some state legislation in order to end qualified immunity and as the mayor of the second largest city in new york state like this guy was just on a press conference with the governor yesterday so he has the ear of the governor and if we wanted certain things to happen we have enough influence to get the ball rolling and that has not happened because there has not been the political will and i think that me winning this election is going to send a strong message that progressive politics is not isolated to downstate that upstate in western new york and all over the state we are ready for a change thank you um thank all you. right here we go lightning round and if anybody has a good lightning round question throw it in the chat in india um so you don't need to be concerned this is taped if there's something that you say which i can't imagine you said anything yet that you don't want out there i'll take it out i just want your honest answers to a lightning round and i, I promise not to uh, trip you up in anything Hopefully. I mean, you never know, because I am going to ask you right now, just to start, the Buffalo Sabres are the uh, the professional hockey team, and the, the Buffalo Bills, the professional uh, football team, of course, there. Do you have any relationship with with either team or any other sports team? Do you, what about Buffalo sports? What I know about Buffalo, being from Syracuse and going to Jets-Buffalo Bills games when I was young, the Bills fans were kind to me. I was decked out in Jets stuff. They were they were legitimately kind. I was there with my pop. They were great experiences. We parked in some guy's front lawn. My dad haggled with him. Anyway, your relationship to those sports teams and who do you like the most, if any? The Bills. I don't, I don't know where your audience is from. All over. But I am a Buffalo girl through and through, and the Buffalo Bills are the only New York State team. That's right. <laughs> 
Hate, hate to break the news to any Jets or Giants fans, um, but the Buffalo Bills are the team of New York State, and I I love the Bills. You know, I have mixed emotions about their owners because I'm also an environmentalist, and I hate fracking, and I also hate the exploitive and extractive nature of the NFL, but you don't grow up in Buffalo without being a sports fan. It's one of the things that unites one of the most segregated cities in the nation, so like Bills, um, Bills, hands down. Now, here's yeah. a, here's a question that could trip you up and hurt you. I don't want it to. Uh, can you explain icing in hockey? <laughs> no, I know. Oh, that's that's when you hit the puck, but it just you, you're not hitting it toward another player. <laughs> Son of a, is, is that, that right? Wrong? I I don't know the answer. I I was just trying to really damage your reputation, apparently, with the hockey fans. With the, with the is that right? Is anybody? I don't know. Well, Carlo, can you help? Carlo's in Canada, so I make an assumption. Carlo, is that qualified? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll forgive her, but that's not icing. <laughs> Oh, I'm we really like, it takes butter buttercream. <laughs> That's closer to icing, absolutely. <laughs> okay, well that does bring me to my next question. What dessert, any dessert, and can you make it? Tiramisu. Yes, I can. Oh wow. Why? Someone got so upset and triggered just now. Did you hear someone scream why in anguish? Like someone screamed why in a way that everything else that you had said was amazing except for that. It was, was it, was it Tom of Noble yes, Pies? It was. It was. Yes, well, they make was. pies for a living, to be fair. Why, Tom? I mean, it's coffee and booze. I don't think you get much better as far as desserts go. <laughs> no, that's, that's funny. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you can bring you. You only get to choose one album on the island that you're going to live on for the next month. Uh, what album are you? I mean, remember when we talked about full albums? I think we we still yeah can do that. Go ahead, India. Mm -hmm. What is the album that you're bringing with you? Um, that's a tough question. What genre of music are you thinking about, even? Um, you know what? I think it might be Outcasts, AT Aliens. Oh, okay. Out that's okay. That doesn't sound relaxing. That's so fucking boss. That's awesome. <laughs> Is it? Awesome? I don't know. Pink, pink. No yeah. comments. You can't comment. Okay, it's a yeah, my, it's, my, it's, a it's a great, great pick. It's a great pick. And yeah, what my people here, I got know, it right here for you. What my friends here know. There it is. Carrie's holding up. Amazing, Carrie. Uh, let me just. What, my, what, nothing about music. Thank nothing. you, Melody. I Shamefully know nothing. 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 <laughs> nothing about white music, black music, any oh, other type of music. Nothing. Yeah. But this music's from Atlanta. This music is from Atlanta, Pete. Well, I don't know what that yeah. even means. So, uh, Carrie, what is that a good choice? Yeah, thank you, Karen. That's hilarious. She's like. Stop talking. Car what do you want to say about her choice, Carrie? He it's an it. excellent choice. Yeah. I mean, I own the album. Uh -huh, I would have gone with Songs in the Key of Life, but okay. um, this is still good. perfectly acceptable. Great choice, Carrie. Um, India, yes. how many children do you have and which do you love the most since they're not oh. listening? <laughs> yes. I have four children. My oldest is 24, and I love him the most because now he can go to the store for me in his own vehicle with his own money. That is an amazing answer, and we applaud it. And, and he can vote. At the yes, and yeah. he can vote, yes. Has he, I have three children that can actually vote. So I have my 24-year-old, and then my twins are 19. Uh, have, have they all endorsed you? I mean, you know. Uh, and finally, <laughs> um, who is a who is a person who has uh, made a huge impact in your life? A mentor, an influencer of, of, of sorts. Could you tell us about that person? Total cliche, but my mother, my mom, my mom is so so strong. She raised six children on her own. Um, I think I might have been like 30 years old before I ever even saw her cry, uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, but I also might have been like 30 before I heard her ever sing. She was always just like laser focused on making sure that we were taken care of. And she she worked so hard and, you know, she's badass. Well, that is a great answer. Uh, there's no way around it. And I won't take up any more of your time. But boy, are we glad to have your presence with us tonight. Hopefully we, we raise a couple bucks and I'll leave that link in there. And 
put it up in the in, in, in the Patreon post. But India Walton, you really and, and I'm just so impressed with your life, your work, your career. You've done more than most people ever do. And uh, I think you're going to win. But if you don't win, I'm so excited to see whatever you do do. But I think you're going to win. And I'm really excited to come up because you already did invite me. And can you invite all of us to your victory party? Yes, please come to Buffalo. June 22nd is the primary. And win or lose, we're going to party hard, okay? Like, these days are so long. I'm like, look, I can't wait to take a nap and, like, just let it all let it all hang out. Um, I'm probably going to be barefoot and wearing very little clothes, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, you're, you're, very, you're very inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us. Give her, put your hands together in front of your camera. Thank you, India. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. That was really fun and interesting and inspiring. Yeah, have a good night. Good night. Hey. Oh man. Can we can we please clone her and send her someone to Texas, please? Oh my god, she's amazing. Yeah, Tennessee Every too. Every city needs her. Oh, well, Buffalo needs her so bad. I can't even begin to tell you. <laughs> It's I a, wish it was a filter for like two hearts coming in and out of my eyes like this. Ah, <laughs> I'd use it right now. Ah, that was Dan McDonald at the end. So many great folks always joining us on Thursday nights. And I love when we have a special guest. I should probably do that every week. And that uh, is India Walton, IndiaWalton.com. Thanks everybody who hung out with me and supported her and donated to her campaign on Thursday night. We did a little fundraiser. I don't know if we raised any money or not. But uh, I love that you would even consider it. And just learning from her and her story is so, so important. So thank you to Tara Simmons, Rep Tara Simmons, out there in Washington. You can support her as well as India Walton. And that is all I've got for you today. Tomorrow, I'm planning on having Aaron David Miller on the Middle East and McKay Coppins of The Atlantic on his really great news story about Brett Kavanaugh and how much he really didn't like Donald Trump, uh, as well as what it means for him to be on the court and the future of the Republican Party, because McKay is a great journalist over at The Atlantic. So whenever I know who I've got, I try to remember to tell you and preview it. Aaron David Miller, McKay Coppins, set to join me tomorrow. Thank you for joining me today. And anytime you do, if you haven't signed up for a paid subscription, this podcast is free, but it ain't cheap. Just hook it up right now. Patreon dot com slash Pete Dominic. Sign up right now. Go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. Thank you very much for listening. John Carroll, why don't you go ahead and take it away? When you're tired of begging, saying pretty please, that's the time you gotta finally get up on your knees. When you can't see the forest for the burning trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creaky knees, you got Stand up, stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in sight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil. Your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand up, no need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up. Stand up, you know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up, show your face of every color yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw the land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could be. Again, they had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look 
Voice inside and listen well, and it'll tell you. Now. 